Welcome to our first crypto screen in two years. What better way to stand up to the supervillain COVID than talk Captain America? So please welcome the screenwriters, Christopher Marcus and Steve McFeely, back to the UCSB Pollock Theater stage. Hey, hey. In the 1940s, Captain America was the patriotic hero that America at war needed. What were your concerns about developing the script to preserve the authenticity of 1940s era Captain America while at making it work for contemporary audience? Yeah, it certainly came up on a number of levels. Uh, just on a marketing level, uh, uh, Marvel and to a I guess it's just Marvel because at that point it was Paramount. Was, Paramount. Yeah. Uh, was worried that the for, uh, Captain America wouldn't play in other countries, right? Uh, and they were worried that a period piece may just land there and, and no one cares. And so I think there was an insistence on bookends just to make sure that, yes, this existed in the real world. But Kevin Feige, and we'll say his name a lot, um, was adamant that the only way this works is if you give him his entire movie in the time in which he was invented, mm -hmm. for which he makes the most sense, at least to start, um, and uh, which was a, a, you know the only way it would work and the, kind of the only way we would be interested in yeah, doing it. Yeah, kind of, it was kind of why we came in. Yeah. The other attempts to, to do it have been split in half, right, where he, he gets on thought at the midpoint. But most importantly is um, everyone and particularly when you got Joe Johnson, um, everyone wanted uh, a movie that felt 40s, but didn't necessarily feel like it was made in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I would identify that distinction, but, but I think we did that. But took its, it's not cynical about the character. Like it's not going, it's not constantly laughing at him. No. Like there's a legitimacy to why he is, got the thing on, you know. Captain America doesn't pull his motivation from the common dark superhero trope, like the murder of his parents, Uncle Ben, or Keanu Reeves' puppy. When setting out to write the origin story of Captain America, how do you approach writing a character who's mostly motivated by innate selflessness? Well, this, this and it, it took us a while, to, it, A, to get the job, and B, to, to, to get it right. Um, and certainly Chris and I had a few unproductive weeks where we said, well, maybe he could be kind of a jerk and then not be a jerk and learn that stuff. Uh, and eventually, it was a lot of it was Marvel and Marvel New York had a say in this. And there's a, you can do all different conversations about the split between Marvel New York and Marvel Los Angeles. Um, uh, but they were adamant that you, that's kind of, you can't mess up that part of his story, right? Mm -hmm. He is innately good. And what we realized was we were being given license to tell kind of a Gary Cooper story, mm -hmm. you know, where, uh, and, this, and this again for early screenwriting students, this is- By the way, kids today love, love a Gary, Gary Cooper, Cooper story. And yeah. know exactly oh. what you mean when Understood. you say it. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> this is a university. <laughs> <laughs> They've got the um, uh, but the, the idea that your character may not uh, change in, this, in the traditional way, you're probably, you know, your three X structures, usually your character, uh, you know, has a dark moment and then eventually overcomes his or her own, you know, uh, internal nonsense. Um, and he doesn't have that. He already kind of has, he's very clear eyed about stuff and he has to change the world around him. And when we figured that out and that would still be a satisfying arc, that's when we kind of locked into the correct way to think about Cap. And it's a, you don't get that opportunity very often, particularly, you know, post the 60s when the anti-hero mm -hmm. showed up and we all loved the anti-hero, but it, Cap is unique in the, in the comics and in, in the MCU, thankfully, because these things worked out as the person everyone turns to, as the guy who is just inherently, a, you know, while I, he doesn't think so, he's a little bit better than everybody else. <laughs> and you would never set out and go, I'm gonna invent a character who's just a bit better than all the other characters. <laughs> but it's, in, it's, it's fun to play with, because it gives this, gravity to this character who doesn't necessarily know how to, especially in this movie, doesn't know how to wear it. But, so his thing is sort of, you know, he does change, but it's not I become good or, you know, good to bad. It's just like I begin to figure out how to be who I already was. 
I mean, he gets the bonus of having a physical change to help him along, but uh, he was already that guy at the beginning. He just needed yeah, a little he, bit of he, coaching. He gets, I mean, again, it was, an, it was a, a, a privilege for us to, to take a character on five or six movie journey, you know, um, where uh, he changes incrementally and learns to be a little bit more self-interested and realize who he is in the world, and it takes him, you know, th six movies to do it. Red Skull is such an important part of the Marvel comic book world. How did you adapt this character to translate his intimidating presence from the comic book to the screen? One, well, no, no, I, I, I'm uh, mostly gonna. One, you decide that that's actually his head, not a mask, which yeah. for a long time in the comics was just a guy in a mask. Nah. Yeah. That wasn't gonna fly. Um, <laughs> and it was tying him in, in the comics he is not uh, necessarily a product of the same line right. of research that created Captain America and it kind of, one, it gave us an excuse as to why he might have a red skull for a head, um, but also it tied him in to the whole basic storyline and didn't make that much, didn't mean there was all sorts of super stuff going on in the world because this hunt for the super soldier mm. is kind of the seed from which, you know, all the Marvel stories grow. And if you also had a Nazi over here who had a secret crystal that made him powerful, like this, so it unifies everything to this hunt for the one thing and they only got the one guy. Um, and that's certainly, I mean, a lesson just in writing is that, you know, in, in general, simple's better. In general, if a scene can do two and three things, that's a scene that's working as opposed to three separate scenes that each do one thing. Um, uh, he's also not that complicated. I mean, again, not to talk about the other movies, but he's certainly the simplest villain we have. Um, you know, he wants to take over the world. And that's a little bit a product of, of us giving ourselves license to have that kind of basic villain in a 40s movie. You know, um, the, the villains in Winter Soldier and Civil War are slightly more nuanced. Right. Yeah. We will talk some Hallie Atwell in, in a bit, but a little about writing Peggy Carter. She appears first in 1966 as a love interest for Captain America in the comic books. What was the development process of writing this 1960s character, placing her in the 40s, and making her, her appeal to today's film audience? I think even in the comics, though, there's the implication that she had been or in like the resistance yeah. in the 40s or something. Yeah, right, yeah. that might be right. Um, she's not English in the comics. Um, she is English to get the tax credit from the United Kingdom. Oh, oh. Which, <laughs> thank God, because it got us Haley Atwell, <laughs> and it made, <laughs> it made her character, I mean, not only is she this independent woman in a time when there, it wasn't respected, but also there's something great about taking an English woman and putting her next to Captain America. Mm gives her a little outside perspective on like, you know, she almost can see how silly the outfit is because it's not her flag. And she can go like, come on, you're, you have, you, there's a human inside there and you better take care of him, otherwise this whole thing's gonna fall apart. Um, so she was unexpectedly, uh, she unexpectedly became kind of an engine in the, I, in the movie. I mean, I, I'm stunned that, that she had, uh, not stunned, but I'm great, grateful she had a, a longer life after that uh, movie, because we sort of figured that no one would ever come back. It was sad. Once we, once we had finished, you know, we had a good time. We thought the movie was good, but it's like, oh, Dum Dum Dugan's never coming back, and God, Haley yeah, Atwell's we'll never coming back. You know, uh, so the idea that, that there was enough um, interest in to get a couple seasons of a show, and God forbid they brought us back so we could keep bringing her back, you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was very gratifying. Casting. Clearly your superstar serum, the screenplay, transformed Chris Evans into an actor who could deliver comedy, action, drama, romance, and heart throughout the entire film. What did he bring to your scripted character? Restraint. Yeah. Um, because we sort of reflexively, you know, made him probably jokier than he might ordinarily be just because you 
you know, the, the writer feels pressure with the weight of the movie on them, and it's just like, I'll, I'll, I know, I'll make him funny, and he'd get poked. And he knew, particularly coming off of two only semi-well-received runs as the Human Torch, where he was Mr. Wacky Joke Guy, he's like, one, I don't want to do it again, and two, that's, I think it's wrong for him to be... He can have a sense of humor, but not like, this is not a guy who tells jokes. This is not a guy who's, you know, out to throw other people off. He is, you know, he's straightforward. He probably says less than more. Yeah. Um, and it, always delighted when an actor says, I want fewer lines. It's, it's That's right. like, That's right. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about like, there's no way you could uh, do too much comedy because it would overshadow the drama of the actual war going on. The uh, humor yeah. tends to come from situations, it comes from other characters, it comes mm -hmm. from his reactions. I've always thought too is that if you knew Evans at all before you went into the movie, you knew him as the guy Chris is talking about, sort mm -hmm. of the smart ass from other movies you may have seen. The and whipped cream bikini. Whipped cream bikini guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> Uh, varsity Blues, not Varsity Blues, but... Not another teen not movie. Not another teen movie is what he did the bikini in. In any case, um, so he's got this reputation as sort of, you know, wacky smart ass guy. And when he's doing this, he's A, you forget it. I, you, if you know it, it's buried. Like I always find myself leaning into his performance because I know there's, there's a funny guy in there and he's not showing it to me. And I, I just find that, that reserve perfect for uh, the 1940s character. Mm -hmm. You're opening with Skinny Steve. He is rejected by the army. He watches newsreels, longing to join the war. Behind the theater, he fights the bully who mocked the soldiers in the newsreels. How do you approach this sequence to set up Steve's character? Um, boy. I vaguely remember it often. I mean, even from early days, starting with him getting beaten up. Um, perhaps with different sparks to it, but um, I don't know. That's That part seemed to be fairly straightforward as far as I can remember. But I, I, long part term. of it's math, right? Mm -hmm. You've got 120 minutes, maybe, um, and we knew that, again, not to reference other movies, but we had seen Iron Man, and Marvel had done Iron Man, and we knew that they had taken, uh, Tony, Tony Stark didn't become Iron Man until 40 minutes into that movie. Um, and that meant they had the confidence to not give you a superhero for almost 40 minutes of that movie. And so we said, is it okay that we keep this guy, Skinny Steve, for a good half hour at mm -hmm. least before he gets jacked? Um, because we want you to fall in love with Skinny Steve uh, before you fall in love with handsome uh, Chris Evans without a shirt on. Yeah. Um, so, so you so do that math, right? Okay, I've got 30 minutes. I know he's got to get picked for the for the program. I know he's got to go through basic training. I know I've got maybe, and I, I need to introduce Bucky Barnes. Uh, you know, all this stuff is the requirements of the screenplay. So the scenes you have, the the real estate is incredibly precious. So when you meet him, for so first of all, the movie meets movie has a frame. So you got 90 seconds of people you never see again. Then you have the villain. Right, starting on, on his quest, mm -hmm. and then you meet um, your hero. And you need to meet your hero doing the thing he wants to do, uh, uh, or ex expressing himself as succinctly, as perfectly as you can. And hopefully showing the obstacles that are gonna prevent him from doing that. It was, it was kind of obvious to us that he, you're gonna meet skin, and you wanna show off his tech, the mm -hmm. tech of the, of the movie, and so, you, you know, yeah, we have him with his shirt off and getting rejected in 4F and boom. I mean, when you, it's, just, it's a weirdly structured movie, oddly. It's, um, I mean, he is not fully fledged heroic Captain America till the midpoint? Well, again, we can get into the structure yeah, of it. I mean, it's not our best midpoint, but yeah. But coming back from... Yeah, from rescuing Bucky and meeting the Red Skull, that's the like midpoint. The, and that, it's only then that he really is the guy you saw on the poster. Right. So it... It is borderline an indulgent amount of time that we got to spend motivating him. Right. You know, normally you hit the ground running. Um, I will say, when he got beat up in the alleyway, I can do this all day, 
was always in there, always felt right, did not know it was going to last for, <laughs> you know, 10 years and however many movies. But yeah. when, you, when we landed on that line, it did feel like, well, okay, that, now I'm beginning to get him, right. you know. Because he can't. Clearly, he's about to get, you know, get all his bones <laughs> right. broken. Hmm. But he doesn't, that's not necessarily bravado. It's just like, no, there's a part of me that would get, get beaten up all, all day for this. <laughs> right. So, uh, Bucky, we mentioned Bucky. Similar to the other question, you only had like two or three minutes with Bucky and mm -hmm. Steve, yeah. but you show brother bond, mutual respect and love. Like it really, you, you felt their friendship yeah. and their bond. And then, of course, the tragic when he leaves for war behind, you know, Steve. Yeah. Uh, what were their challenges of trying to, you had to establish their relationship because of the heart of the film, yeah. but yeah. with yeah. not a lot of time. Yeah. Well, every scene has to do more than one thing, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So the very same scene, scene that shows that he's not gonna back down to bullies is also the scene, scene that introduces how Bucky has, relates to him. And you get from that, oh, he must be dragging his ass out of alleys all the time, mm -hmm. right? This is how it works, he's the big brother. Um, but and there's it, also, there's something very, because they skinnied him so well, the fact that they're such good friends despite the physical disparity, which normally in the, you know, in movie math would mean that the big guy bullies the little guy and he wouldn't be friends with him. It tells you something about both of them without, without dialogue. One, it tells you there's real value to this skinny little guy that is, you know, beyond, beyond physicality. And it tells you Bucky's actually a very nice guy. You know, like beyond the fact that he saves him, it's like he's friends with him for genuine reasons. They like each other. And the, the, uh, even, perhaps even more important than that is, uh, is the moment when they part, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, we're on a fabulous double date. This could be going great, but I'm going to go once again, <laughs> try to sign up for the army, and I'm going to ruin this double date. <laughs> and so, so in a moment of crisis, Bucky calls him out, and, and one of the, I think one of the more sort of poignant lines or, or insightful lines is, uh, is Bucky goes, yeah, because you've got nothing to prove, mm -hmm. right? And it's him sort of go, and, and we recognize, oh yeah, Steve's got this much ego. Like, I, you know, I really want to do this because people keep telling me that I'm, I'm a schmuck, you know? I want to serve, I want to help, but I also want to be more than I am. Uh, and he can call him on that. And then they had, you know, all the cute sort of, I'm taking all. But it's interesting because Bucky at no point thinks any less of Steve. Like he says, he's, no, he's, 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 he sees no. more of Steve than Steve does. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I know you don't have the physical, but you got more heart than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sweet. It's, yeah. uh, but talking about sweet moments, uh, you, again, you only had two scenes with Stanley Tucci and Chris Evans, yeah. you know, fundamentally. Uh, three scenes, sorry. Mm. Uh, I love the thing, like, why do you want to kill, you have know, killed nuns? Like, I don't want to kill anybody. I just want to stand yeah. the bullies. Of and of course, the great drinking scene right. where we learn about the heart. What was, what did, what, what was going on there? Because Stanley Tucci and Chris Evans really connected. Was it just like, you guys worked together in the script? It just, it flowed or something no, happened? No, I think set. they hung out a little bit on set. Yeah. I think Tucci, again, didn't invite the writers, uh, <laughs> but, you know, Tucci would have people over to it. I think there was cooking, there was drinking. I mean, I think it was, you know, and he, again, he's not all on set. I think he may have done two weeks. Mm. You know, it's not like he's there for the four-month shoot. Uh, he's just a great character actor. He's a great character <laughs> actor, and it's, I mean, the, that dynamic is very nice. The, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> um, the, I mean, it, it's, a, it's the only father Steve ever has. Mm. So there is something very warm about that relationship and the fact that he saw the goodness in him, mm. be, you know, beyond his weakness. How that translated to how they felt, I don't know. I think they're just both good at their jobs. But, um, and again, kind of unsung in the larger Marvel myth that Joe Johnston did a hell of a job on this. And yeah. he's incredibly good at imbuing things with a kind of non-cheesy, pure heart. Like, mm -hmm. it never feels tacky when he does it. Um, yeah, he does Ernest really well. Yeah. yeah, and I think he gets it out of everybody. It was a nice character moment. I just realized when uh, Stanley Dear said, you know, do you mind if I'm German? Mm -hmm. 
Because of course there's a lot of, you know, yeah, yeah. that actually, yeah, obviously in 1940s. Well, he says, where are you from? And he goes, Queens. In, in, yeah. in Germany, but it was just a nice moment. It's like, no, I hold nothing against anybody unless they're, you know, bullies. Right. That was yeah. a sweet little character thing that kind of set up yeah. Steve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, um, yeah. You I, also have to remember just on a technical level, think about them shooting that scene that day or say across the, on the bunks, right? Chris Evans is, you know, built like this, but he's sitting there like this. He's got dots all over his face. I mean, like, there's yeah. a lovely chemistry to that scene, and the actual making of it couldn't be more clinical. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I can't remember. They may have shot it twice, once with... Uh, with Leander, yeah. The, yeah. Leander, the body of... The skinny body. Right. Yeah. Um, who was just a yeah. lovely, skinny Englishman. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, any scene with Skinny Steve is even, when you think about it, it's even weirder because yeah. there's people talking to the wrong guy at various points. There's a right. cut of this movie with a totally different head. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, and I guess it is harder for an actor because you have this you know, you know, very painful emotional scene to do and you have the dots in the special. And you have the dots in yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, like, and they're pros at this point, yeah. but it's for us, I and mean, this is you know, not our first movie, but it was, uh, we felt very attached to it and we were there on set every damn day. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I can't, I can never, I, I can't understand how they get good performances because like I would never give a good performance, you know, yeah. if you had dots all over your face, this would be a very awkward conversation. It would be terrible. Yeah, I'd be mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I'd have high expectations for what you look like in post though. <laughs> I actually, that's what you have talked about that. I'd like to fix me in post. Um, so I, you know, the sequence, I, the army training scene, I just love it's, I, it's a Rocky scene for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's. He, 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 you know, he can't do anything right. He's falling behind. Yeah, he shows the smart one, unscrews the flagpole. Mm -hmm, great moment. Mm -hmm. And of course, the key, the dramatic moment, is when he throws himself in the hand grenade, the only soldier to do it. Mm -hmm. So what was the challenge, uh, or how do you wrestle with, you have to convince the characters in the movie and the audience in that sequence that, yes, it has to be Captain America. We have mm -hmm. to buy it, too. Right. So what was that? Well, was you it? hit it, right? I mean, like, we, so what did we, we spent time uh, before realizing he wants it. He wants to contribute. All right, so I, I get that. But why does anybody else feel that he has, is earning this moment? Um, you try really hard, that's great. But if you fall on your face, that doesn't, that doesn't help. So we needed a moment that crystallized. I, th I think we decided selflessness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not mistaken, you know, we went around and around. And, and, and I think Joe eventually said, I remember this movie from like 1940. And yeah, we could never find the movie. <laughs> yeah, somebody, I think we knew it at one point and now it's lost to history, uh, uh, where basically somebody jumps on a grenade. And yeah. he says, let's just do that. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of what we did. You know. But also the smarts thing was good with the flag. Oh, yeah. Ball. That oh, also yeah. sets up that he's intelligent and also for, you know, Peggy to kind of like, okay, this yep. kid has something going. Yep. Like he's. And, and that is another sequence that I'm sure, like the big montage later, was probably, we probably had scenes for all of that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with dialogue and beginnings and ends. And as the, you know, the script approached 400 pages, mm -hmm. you begin to go, well, we this, you know, we gotta, we gotta move through this as a, as a, you know, continuous motion rather than mm -hmm. tell the story of each part of his, yeah. you know, so. Right. In fact, that the flag scene is a reshoot. Oh, yeah, we had a, we had assembled it and went. He's just not doing enough to earn it, you know. And and so we uh, ended up being, you know, uh, finding a clever way for him to very quickly, you know. And it works because really, Tommy Lee Jones. If you can convince his character, you can convince mm -hmm. anybody. That's right. And he even he came around. Yeah. Well, when you Ooh. jump on the grenade and you're the, you're the horse you picked, you know, ran <laughs> yeah, like ran a scaredy away. cat, you know, like there's. It's sort of obvious. Uh, so one of the things we, the exercise we do with the students is after a movie, we said, what was the most emotional scene? Hmm. Just off the top of the head. And I always like to go for scenes that maybe are not the most typical. And a lot of the ones hit on one scene, just that skinny Steve and Peggy in the car. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah it was just something where, it, you know, yep. the, it wasn't the action scenes. It was something like, it was just it's something special going on. You're setting up the romance. You're setting up a lot of things. What, what, how, what was, how did that work? How did you like work with Chris and Haley and the, the writing? Like the, that scene does work. What was it, it about does it? Well, one, there is, and again, sort of in the same way where you, you think differently about Bucky because he respects and, and feels like an equal to Skinny Steve. I think attraction is first evident there on Haley's part. Hmm. And 
and that had to like it had to pre-exist to predate the experiment. Mm. It can't just be oh now that he's hot I like it. Right, right. It it had to be she likes the man inside. So that's a key scene in their kind of evolution. Um, and it's also him admitting intense weakness and being kind of uh, really unsure. I mean, he's just going, I got beat up there, and I got beat up there, and I got beat up there. He's just listing his own weaknesses and then saying he's not good with girls. And it's, it's, it's very endearing to have you know, you're, I mean, he's not a superhero yet, but you're here. He's not embarrassed by it either. It's like, I got no, beat up. What like, are you going to oh, do? No. And remember, this scene, I, I harp on this. It's doing, it's, it's, it's giving you chemistry. And as Chris pointed out, it's the first time she, by, the, by, the, by the end, you go, oh, she might like, she might like Skinny Steve, right? Um, it's him talking about his vulnerability. It's her acknowledging what it's like to be a woman in a man's yeah. world, mm -hmm. which, you know, we, we assume that she has an opinion on. This is her opinion on that. Like, it's all coming together in one 90 second car ride scene. Um, I mean, that's, that's, I can't stress that enough. It's like, is, is it, it, you have to be lean about your structure and your scenes. And if your scene is just doing one thing, you haven't, it's, mm -hmm. it's not doing the work it needs to do. Yeah, we also got like the fact that um, she wasn't defined by her relationship to Steve. Her yeah. romantic feelings, and that was critical. Yeah, I'm sorry, sure. too often in superhero movies, oh. none of yours, of course. But uh, no, but it, uh, no. it's like way too often they just become, like, it, it, there's a middle of a war going on. Yeah, she, they're interested in each other, of course they both are. Yeah. Right. But, you know, they're fighting a war. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's, particularly when we got around to doing Agent Carter, thought longer about her her biography, yeah. and we couldn't get it all into the show because it didn't last long enough. There's things, there's fascinating things about Peggy you do not yet know, <laughs> and I don't know how they'll be gotten across, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on there, and it's more, if you feel your character is, what, what I would love is to know that you come away from a movie we've written knowing this person has a past and a future and you're watching the intersection but this mm -hmm. character did not come to being simply to service <laughs> this yeah. moment right. um and your best movies make you go i wonder what the hell mm -hmm. that guy went through to be that way when i encountered him and so yeah it's just that's that's the hope is that there's always so we're going to segue to Frankenstein. Uh, you really do kind of have a Frank. You have a Frankenstein series. The sci mad scientist is going to murder mm -hmm. the body of skinny, you know, and the father figure. So, but it's kind of, yeah. you know, almost dark. I mean, there's a lot of danger and risk going needles. on. Needles. And of <laughs> course, exactly. And then, uh, yeah, I don't like the needles part. And then the, and of course, emotionally, when you know uh, Stanley Tucci's character, yeah. you know, gets yeah. in the heart. What, what, what went into that? Because that was kind of. I like the scene, but it was kind of creepy. Uh, oh, I think we wanted to make it uh, uh, feel, I remember a lot of the touchstones w um, were more about the space program. Ah. Um, because the, the idea was that this was a new chapter, this was a bold experiment, even to the point where that thing lifts up in the air, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to just having this sort of, you know, flaccid scene here, you know, on the on the table. That was Joe, I think, definitely wanted to, to this idea that... Throwing the word flaccid in I know, it does not make think about a rocket ship now. <laughs> but, but, the, but uh, uh, so that's why it was all, it was all, you know, if you look at it through that lens, you'll see a lot of just sort of, uh, you know, it should feel like the right stuff to a degree. Hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. But yes, of course, it's scary and there's a lot of, you know, goo. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's also, I mean, one, it's, it is fairly faithful to the comics that scene yeah. is you know that's he always i mean sometimes it just looks like him getting a shot on a, oh, on it's a table in the, in the original one it's four panels but <laughs> but he he's skinny he goes there are people observing yeah. he turns big and then the assassin comes like the math of that is yeah. from 1941 um but it was yet another moment for steve to be it's the last moment where you go, wow, skinny Steve is the brave one here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I get Be I get a little choked up when when it's all going to hell and the, and and uh, Peggy wants to stop it yeah. and, yeah. He and he goes no yeah. I can do I it can you know from it. inside that thing is like oh jeez and it's not just like I, I, I can do it because uh, I, I said I would. I can do it because I need to prove myself. I can do it because I can withstand this. I mean, it's just a lot going on. It was also good timing because immediately after he chases the bad guy. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't give a lot of time, like we're wondering what his powers are. Did you want to quickly, like you know what, we got to show what he can do. He learns he can jump the fence. Yeah, sure. Like you didn't want to waste any time with. We wanted like him to be like a, a, a newborn colt, yeah. right? So he runs. He runs into a wind into a storefront, you know, because he doesn't yeah. know, you know, how to turn. What I, I what I love about that whole sequence is the very end of it after uh, the uh, assassin has killed himself and only then does he have yeah. it's the first time he's gotten <laughs> yeah. the opportunity to go like holy crap <laughs> like everything right. is different now right. and I just did that on instinct I, I just, just punched you know, a sub yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I for some reason I just love the little kid like the old shocks kid like yeah, I like, can swim like I, I, I can swim it. saved us it I works great <laughs> I'm like you know I don't need saving just go get him like yeah, I love yeah. that moment it was such a okay um, we teach a lot of film history here so I want to talk a little about maybe a fun sequence how fun was it to write the sequence of propaganda newsreels ah. you know the USO tour sure. and it's really the history of cinema that's straight what you know really did happen um, so what was that like to kind of kind of go that way it was uh, a it was a lot of fun um, it allowed the movie on a just a it allowed the movie to go we know what you might be thinking about Captain America yeah, right. we get it here 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 kind of is a version of how you think he is right. mm. You people who haven't thought enough about him, <laughs> you know, he's or the, haven't followed the like the comics yeah. are. If, if you've done a deep dive, you know he's not as square uh, or as propagandistic as you might think. But like, for outsiders, this was a way to just bubble two minutes of of, of this is what you think, mm -hmm. and to sh you know then to show him at the end unsatisfied yeah. with it. But it's also, I think Steve wrote the line "Star Spangled Man" with the plan. Yeah, I don't get credit for all the music uh, or anything. And yeah, then they went and got Alan Menken, yeah. and then we oh. spent <laughs> like a week or two in a theater in, in Hackney in London <laughs> with that song playing over <laughs> and over and over again. Uh, so yes, I have very fond yet sort of <laughs> damaged memories of, of, of that whole sequence. At the same time, the sequence ends when the, the real soldiers kind of mock and throw tomatoes stuff. at yeah. him. Yeah. Was that important to kind of just show, you know, this is the contrast of what the civilians look yeah, at war, yeah. and this is what real people look at war at? Well, That's, yep. also to punch, to, to punch a hole in Steve a little bit, because mm. you can feel it, his ego is probably inflating a bit as he goes from town to town, and beautiful girls are hugging him, and uh, everyone's cheering, but he gets to the guys doing what he wanted to do, right. and they think he's an idiot. Um, that takes him right, I mean, he's, he's effectively Skinny Steve again when he's sitting on those steps drawing the monkey. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But at no point, the thing I liked about it, and one of my students made this comment, is he never becomes a jerk, though. Even in the USO tour, he still, he, he didn't understand what was going on, but he never got egotistical. Right. Like, he never really... No, he's always, he's a little sheepish all the sheepish, time. Sheepish, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, even when... Uh, the lady from Game of Thrones comes on to him, you know. <laughs> I guess he's, he's, yeah, he's relentlessly uh, 98 pounds from Brooklyn, you know. Did you know you were writing the Game of Thrones lady at the time? We, did, we just knew it would be some <laughs> hussy. <laughs> But at, but at the same time, he, he goes rescues Bucky, which was a wonderful scene. Mm. But he gets a little rebellious, a little messy. The yeah. dirty dozen, he starts going, he goes AWOL, the dirty dozen. Well, that's what I mean. The going AWOL is a thing he does all the time. Right. I mean, again, do we, do we get, if you don't know the comics, you don't understand this. But, like, you know, he, he tells the government to F off constantly because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, he's about the ideals of the country and not about anybody who's you know, has a title over him. Did it help you a little rise? Now you move to the point of story where you can be a little more defiant, where he doesn't have to be so pure. He can kind of push the envelope a little. But dramatic. remember, he starts defiant. He lies oh, yeah. five times, oh, you know? Like, he's a liar. <laughs> he lies in act one in order to get what he wants. But he's a guy who, you know, he's always known what he's there for. And it's just stages of him getting to the point where he can fulfill what 
not just fulfilling his destiny. It's like I'm built to be good to be you, to do this, but I don't have the body for it. Then I get the body for it. Now no one will let me do it. Um, and it's not ego, though. It's just like, they, look, there's a job that needs to be done, right. and I'm, I'm the guy. I did like the moment where Bucky says, I don't want to follow Captain America. Yeah. I'll follow Skinny C, my best friend, to the ends of the earth. too yeah. dumb to. Yeah, yeah that that was, I thought that was yeah. one of the sweeter moments of the movie. I also uh, love, that's, another, that's a scene where Bucky looks, and Sebastian's very good at this. Uh, forgive my language, he looks totally up by what he's experienced. <laughs> right. Like something horrible happened to him, as we will later learn, uh, in, when he was a prisoner. And he looks like a guy who the war is eating away at him, mm. where it, you know, yeah. Steve is sort of physically elevating and Bucky is, is, is having a rough time. And this is long, be I mean, he, Sebastian may have known, I mean, read the comics that Winter Soldier was it, but there was no way we were ever going to get to do Winter Soldier <laughs> at that point. Um, so that maybe just might be how he looks, but maybe he had a <laughs> night on the town the night before, but he's, he looks like a human who's been through war. Um, I always like that contrast between. I also like the moment where you know Captain America is blaming himself for Bucky dying, and Peggy's like, you know, we're all, you know soldiers. We all sign up for this, and yeah. he loved you. Well, yeah, and oh, yeah, <laughs> you know? it's it's it, actually that comes back around, right? He's uh, he's basically uh, he's you know he was a soldier, honor his choice, mm -hmm. right, to to do this. He will then take that language back at the end when he goes into the ice, and like this is my choice, Peggy. Like you got to back off, as she told him to back off of his own guilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your, your first conf confrontation with Red Skull, yeah. the, the mirror image, basically Captain seeing the opposite of himself. Yeah. But there, yeah. what, were you, what was the challenge of that sequence? Because you're setting up a lot, you're, set, you're saving Bucky, but you're actually setting up the final battle. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, our, it's one of our more simplistic structures, right? It's basically the midpoint is the good guy meets the bad guy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they really just come together and then, and then circumstance sort of splits them apart. Um, uh, so it works, and it particularly works as a midpoint to, to motivate uh, the back half of the act for Cap, and he gets his team, and he gets, uh, as Chris said, you know, Tommy Lee Jones now respects him and can, you know, will we'll put him to the correct use. Um, but, but good guy meeting bad guy, having sort of the classic, we are two sides of the same coin, you and I, is pretty rudimentary. Uh, particularly by our standards. I like well, it's think. also the, speaking of, you know, we, we delayed full cap till about that point. Mm. It's, that's the only time, that's the first time you get the Red Skull. Yeah. Mm. It's been, I mean, part of, the, part of the reason we could do that is we had Hugo Weaving who has a fantastic face. Right. So like it's skull-like to begin with. It's sort of along the same mm. lines of like when you get Willem Dafoe you have the Green Goblin on right. screen all the right. time because his yeah. face is crazy. Um, <laughs> but it is a full, you know, revelation. It, it becomes a superhero movie mm. sort of on that catwalk. Uh, can we recommend maybe, could you give us a full two hour script one day or movie of the scene where he was getting the portrait painted of him? Because we were all comedy and we'd love to see that expanded. <laughs> Would you guys mind doing that? What's <laughs> fantastic <laughs> is if you manage to get into the Marvel offices in Burbank on yeah. the Disney lot <laughs> and you're uh, in one of the rooms where there's some couches and things and there's a column. and. If you, then the, behind the column's kind of shadowy. If you go behind the column, the painting is hanging. Because <laughs> they really did it. Even though you don't see it, it's, yeah. it's the Red Skull. It's yeah. a full oil painting of the Red Skull. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it was, uh, but Hugo was great in that scene. It just like you said, the face, his face is just so commanding. And yeah. Terrifying. And yeah. Toby, yeah. Toby Jones is, <laughs> It's delightful the way those two play off each other. Uh, we're going to jump a little to the climax. Um, so you have the big fight, of course, with Captain and Red Skull. Mm. But really, it's a lot of about Peggy and, you know, Peggy and Cap. Peggy kiss. They finally kiss. The conversation. 
Was there any thoughts about how you're going to end the climax? Because you decided not to show the fiery crash and keep it about the relationship mm -hmm. that was about then, instead of more of the you know we had the dramatic fight, but ultimately it was about. Well, you know, the the remit of the project was whatever we do, we've got to get him to the Avengers, mm -hmm. right? So when we take the job, it's it's an origin story, takes place in the '40s, and you can't kill him exactly because he's, he's gonna, and the question was whether, whether uh, like, what was the, qu uh, whether he would be defrosted in our movie or Joss's movie mm -hmm. was always the question, you know, because there was a version, remember these are all happening simultaneously or like we're in you know, month six and they're just starting and that, so that those questions come up all the time and I guess there was a moment where defrosting him or finding him could be the beginning of Avengers, you know, before he started writing. Um, uh, so we knew, it, it turned out, one of the things Chris and I like about adapting is that it's like playing tennis with a net, right? So you go, all right, well, I, here are the rules of the road. You can't go past that line and that line and that net. Now do whatever you want or, you know, now do, make, make the best play. Um, so that gave us license to go, all right, well, what, what's the tragic ending? What's the ending? That guy mm -hmm. has to save people, but he also has to lose something because mm -hmm. he's not going to die. So what's he going to lose? And so he's going to lose what is the best romance in the MCU, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's clear, good, palpable chemistry. Uh, and what's the best way to lose that? By have them being hard bitten about the loss that they're facing. So the reason why if you get teared up there, it's because they're both trying to pretend this awful thing isn't happening. I, I mean, and then I'm she has to spend the next 70 years lamenting in his death, and he mm -hmm. gets to wake up. So it's even a little okay, more tragic now for her, too. Technically, she probably only has to spend about four years because he'll come back <laughs> if, from if, the future. Yeah, but did he always <laughs> is that, yeah, there's, But there's, did there's you know some that? Debate. There's some debate. <laughs> But we'll talk a little bit, we're gonna open up pretty soon, but we'll talk a little about Winter Soldier. It's a different film. You had a different yeah, tone yeah, yeah. and it, you know, he's obviously, he's in a new world, fish out of water clearly, but mm -hmm. it's a corrupt system. He's yeah. butting up against spies, things he couldn't stand. Um, how was it to write as it now take it's kind of a new genre, a new, new, new place to talk about a totally different yeah. world for Cap? Uh, it was fun. I mean, it's... It's actually the role for Cap, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like Cap mm -hmm. in the comics, that's what you know of him if you're a comic fan. He's the man out of time. Yeah. Most people, the, the story of the man in the 40s was one we kind of had to sort of, you know, pick and choose and try to corral, you know. Um, but but the, the man out of time and one who doesn't understand the society he's in or doesn't sort of walk in step with it, that's the, that's the, the character primarily, right? There's also just something, I mean, there's a lot of things to love about that movie and to, there's, there's just something great about someone who wants to clean house, yeah. you know? And I think we all feel, no matter what era we're in, like, it's just a swamp around me, you know? I wish there was someone who could fix this. You know, it was I, interesting him in relation with Nick Fury, too, because, you yeah. know, he's not happy with Nick, he doesn't like the showery figure, but respects him, yeah. kind of become, like, there's a lot of complex things going on. Did yeah. you have fun messing with Nick Fury? Because it was the first time you kept him off balance. Like, the first time he was mm. in Jeopardy, this is the thing. Yeah. Steve changes the people around him, all right? So how do you change the super spy? Yeah. You say all your super spyness has gotten you uh, into this, this morass because it turns out you're a super spy for uh, your, own, your own organization is corrupt. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, yeah, I mean, how, how do you shock the person who knows everything? Yeah. Just tell them something they don't know. Yeah. All right. Now, your first movie, you had the, um, the romantic relationship with Peggy, but now you have more of a platonic relationship. How was that kind of, you really kind of set up Natasha's ah. relationship. How was that kind of process working mm. for getting a different type of relationship? Mm -hmm. It, I mean, we very explicitly did not want it to be a romantic relationship to, to have, because it's what they're talking about. She's needling him about like, do you go on dates? Do you do, right. do these things? But they're actually very similar people. They're, they're people whose lives were taken from them. I mean, his, his was voluntarily taken from them, but they're, they're essentially both government products of opposing mm. sides. And they're both 
in different ways, trying to live in the yeah. world in that's very sort of not built for people like them. And she, she's clearly, though, uh, uh, allowed herself to get muddier. Yeah. Right? She is comfortable in the Well, murk. she was and made to be muddy. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that is the stark distinction and why it's fun to rub them against each other because they have a lot in common, but their worldviews are, mm -hmm. uh, are, are different enough that you can get, like, really, that conversation mm -hmm. in the car is pretty juicy. Yeah. You know? But it's another thing where, again, the fact that they respect each other gives gives a more gravity to both of them. Like, you'd think the cynical super spy would go like the Boy Scout, which is what right. everybody who doesn't know what Captain America is calls him. Right. And and how he and also, frankly, how he came off in the first Avengers movie. Hmm. He right. they kind of put him back in Boy Scout mode, and we wanted to yeah. get him out of Boy Scout mode again. Um, so this deeply cynical person respects this guy and goes, there's way more going on here than, <laughs> than the silly blue outfit. And he goes, you know, and the, the same way. You, the, can't, you can't be as cynical as you let on. Yes, but yeah. the knee jerk <laughs> external response to uh, Black Widow is sexy, sexy lady in a leather suit. Right. And he sees right past that and he's like, you're a soldier a pretty screwed up soldier, and I, I understand. Right. They have chemistry throughout all the movies. Oh, like, yeah. they're, they're, they're really good together. And remember, last time we were together, you talked about how fun it was to actually end their relationship with Endgame. The yeah. concept, like, mm -hmm. take it full circle, and yeah. you started it yeah. and end it. But at the same time, you know, there was a pattern, like, you seem to really like the relationships part. Now, if you take Civil War, you really flipped it, where Captain America is the one who doesn't want to follow orders, mm -hmm. and Iron Man flips it. So was that kind of also interesting, kind of explore? Now you have a different kind of classic oh, yeah. relationship, and they're flipping. Well, we, that's, again, the beauty of working with so much material and so much iceberg behind you, right? Mm -hmm. All these movies are, are, are changing these characters. Um, in subtle ways, and we realized at one point that those guys were crossing, you know, and that it it did it absolutely did make sense for Captain America to um, buck the system and try to protect uh, mm -hmm. Bucky against you know the authorities, and it it got to a point where it made sense for Tony to throw in with the authorities because he felt culpable mm -hmm. about some of the stuff he'd done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not a Tony you you the Tony you see in Civil War is not the same Tony in Iron Man. But he makes sense, mm -hmm. and that's the same thing with Steve. And, and, and by the time you get to the end of the line, you know one of them's going to go, you know, have a life, and the other one's going to lose his, and that's and they're on the other opposite of where they started. Oh, uh, screenwriting teachers, I remember mine said you, you always have to kill your babies, scenes that you love but don't fit mm -hmm. or don't work in the story. Was there anything in the Captain America movies which, oh my God, I wish we could have known his character? It was a brilliant thing, but it just didn't oh, work. All sorts, all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, Panzer Max. <laughs> it wasn't great, but there was a, in the in the in the base at the end they had kind of a a, a tank robot that yeah. was <laughs> huge Nazi tank Nazi robot. Tank, yeah. Um, the, we had scenes. I mean, again, this Avengers, but still, um, of what uh, Cap and Falcon and Natasha were up to post-Civil War when they were on the run. Um, and it was just interesting, because they were sort of down on their luck. They were trying to uh, still be heroes, but it was unfunded and kind of gross and bloody and justifiably removed from the movie. It had no business being in it, but it was it's an interesting pocket. We must have, because uh, the, we got the Captain America job, holidays of 2008. Mm -hmm. And we wrote the entire next year and didn't start shooting until, say, March or April of 2010. Wow. Yeah. So we must, I just can't, for the life of me, think right now what we threw away, but we must have thrown away a ton. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. He at one point snuck into a, f he snuck into the fair. Because he, yeah, there was oh, yeah, just yeah, yeah. a bunch, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it took a while to find him, you know, because yeah. your knee jerk is. Well, it took a while to find him and it took a while to wrangle that shape. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a it it's effectively birth to death. It's a biopic, mm -hmm. um, and there are more montages in it than we normally do because 
you really need to, this guy needs to be a seasoned hero by the end of the movie, right. which you don't have, you know, you don't have time to show his war career. Um, and on a practical level, if it was a hit, you'd want to go back and make Captain America 2, yeah. yeah. and is that in the 40s? Could be, because we don't, they don't yeah. know. They, this is before, Winter Soldier is really the movie where they went, oh, we're telling a long story. Okay. Yeah. And we can, and we'll start playing with genre and we'll do all that stuff. They just, you know, 2008 and nine, that was not on the, in the cards. Right. Uh, well, our final question is, since we have students here in academic institution, we're gonna let you be professor, as we've done before. Okay. So your job is to assign a TV show or a movie, something that they should watch for screenwriting. Could be past, present, last year, something you grew up with. What would you want them to study as a good screenwriting lesson? Huh, well, I've got a few. Yeah. It's interesting that you said TV. Because you get to name a thing that, uh, if you know what it is, um, your knowledge of it is probably that it was cheesy. Um, but I was thinking about it yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, Miami Vice. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back and watch this show, one, the production values make it look like it, it, it literally shot like porn. It's, <laughs> it's lit so weirdly. But what you will also see is that it is bleak as mm. hell. Like I, I, they sold it on fluorescent colors and fast cars and the guys don't wear ties and it is, a, it is years about failure and about your heroes not getting the job done. And seeing that when I was in high school was kind of mind blowing about like, not all hero stories are about the hero kicking ass and throwing the guy in a cell at the end of, of the episode. They're just constantly going <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, rem I, to this day, remember the sort of gravity of that. Um, and then you should just watch Chinatown and, and <laughs> sure. Marvel. That's a tough one though as a screenwriting lesson. It's yeah, so no, it's high, it's high wire. Um, easier screenwriting lessons are, no, but no less great. Um, uh, on a blockbuster level, you know, Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back are really kind of, you know, uh, uh, clean. You know, but in terms of uh, their end of acts and their midpoints, and even we call them pinches because we use the Sid Field model. Uh, the reason Chris and I got into screenwriting because it was because of Seven. Um, as we saw it and we went, oh, we're scared. Oh, we're impressed that 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 because we were completely like everyone else who first sees it, you know, shocked at the third act and didn't know where this was going. Um, so that's the kind of script where if you know what the rhythms are, uh, you can then get uh, tricked, you know, because when uh, when uh, John Doe walks in at the end of two, you're like, oh, no, that's the worst thing that could happen. Because I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's like, you know, I, it's a, I no longer know what I'm watching. Yeah, exactly. And it's, that's, that's thrilling. Yeah. I'm going to throw one out, which I've never done before, mm -hmm. related to Captain America. I'm going to recommend Three Days of the Condor. Well, that's the one uh, we rip off. Yeah. Because, you know, and it is, you know, but it is kind yeah. of like, you want to spy, and related to Captain Winter Soldier, yeah. it is a great spy movie, you know, Average yeah. Joe, Robert, Re well, Robert Redford, Average Joe, but, yeah. uh, you know, 1970s kind of like conspiracy theory. And it's where we movie. learned how to do that, right? Yeah. Where it's, it's the... Uh, 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 main character doesn't know who's chasing him or why he's being chased, and in the middle, he figures it out and then goes on offense. Mm -hmm. Well, I do want to thank you. This is our first movie and Q&A in the theater in two years. So Welcome yeah. back. Happy to be back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. So thanks so much, and of course, we'll see you again uh, with your next awesome movie.